Here we go. All right. Let's make sure everyone's in. I hope everybody's uh, doing well today. Hope everybody can hear me. I didn't have any problems with my audio interface. Awesome. Let's see. I have um, that happening. Yo, yo. What are you doing there, buddy? Gonna just hang out there the entire time, huh? Yeah. Oh, that's uh. Oh, there he goes. Now he's gone. Okay, good. Hard to lecture with such a big distraction sitting beside me. All right. So today we're going to begin the chapter on women, feminism, and technology. So this was one of the most popular choices. Uh, but as I was saying, since it's next in the book, I figured we'll go ahead and cover it. And we won't make our way through the whole chapter today. Um, but we should get uh, we should get a good way through it. Uh, also, I'm going to uh, probably be riffing a bit today. Uh, you know, just just riffing because um, uh, prep time is kind of at a premium <laughs> to the end of the semester. So I tend to go with what I've remember from reading and what I've written on the slides. And uh, anyway, the, the point is, take lots of notes. Um, let's get some discussion going. Um, because I think this is really interesting and important. And, and with the age of this book, I mean, this book was written in 2006, or sorry, published in 2006. So uh, that's, um, I mean, over a decade ago now, getting close to two decades, really. Um, and there have been a lot of developments in feminism and feminist theory and women's rights and uh, all kinds of things um, recently within the last decade or so that maybe it would be interesting to mention in the context of what Duzik discusses here. So if anyone has any thoughts at any point, you know, uh, jump right in. Um, also, after the lecture, um, because I can't seem to share my video when I'm sharing my screen on Zoom. I have examples of, uh, since we're talking about uh, technology, household technology is one of the technologies we'll be talking about. Um, everybody should actually go and check out um, some of these commercials that I found from the 50s and 60s, which are unapologetically sexist, um, just to get a sense of, um, you know, uh, how far things have come, but also how far we still have to go. I've got a few bookmarked up here. The Folgers commercials were the worst. They're not really for an appliance or anything, just for coffee, but oh my God, so, so sexist. Like, I was like, uh, I was aghast. Like surprised, but not really surprised, I suppose. But anyway, uh, that'll be something you may want to watch on your own time, and I'll make some links available on the um, on the Discord server for those that are interested in checking that out. All right, so let's start our slides from the beginning. Okay, so. Feminist philosophy, let's read about um, just sort of Duzik's set up of the chapter. He writes, feminist philosophy of technology is part of the larger movement and project of feminist philosophy in general. Feminist philosophy started in applied ethics where issues of gender with respect to abortion, child rearing, sexist language and general issues of male power and dominance are most obvious. Okay. Um, but he quickly points out that feminist philosophy is not limited to applied ethics. 
feminist philosophers of uh, technology, for example, working in the 1970s, they were part of the so-called second wave of feminism. <clears throat> and here we had uh, thinkers like Evelyn Fox Keller, Donna Haraway, who we'll probably talk about next time, and Sandra Harding. And around the same time, we had um, uh, feminist epistemology as well, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. But one thing that I found curious about this chapter is that we don't really get the history of what led up to feminism. Uh, and this is a philosophy book. Uh, Duzek, uh, at least not yet in the chapter. I mean, I, I don't want to be too uncharitable here, but in other chapters, Duzek goes way back into the history of philosophy uh, in, in a lot of his discussion. Not so much here, not as far back. But of course, the reasons for that may be um, that many women were just not able to practice philosophy. Even those that were able were perhaps not allowed. There were women philosophers. Uh, throughout history, there have been many great women philosophers. I mean, maybe you could even make an argument um, that feminism really originated in ancient Greece or something, right? With, with somebody like Sappho. Sappho was a poet. Uh, and she came from a, a Greek island called Lesbos. Um, and, and yeah, you may, be, you may be guessing, wait a minute, Lesbos? Yes, Sappho was a lesbian. She was a lesbian woman. Um, she was a poet. She wrote a lot about erotic love uh, between women. Um, and that's where the term lesbian comes from, uh, from that island where Sappho was from. Yeah, you're right, the suffragettes. And we're going to get there. We're going to get there. But we do have a little more territory to cover. So we have Sappho of Lesbos, right? Also, the word sapphic, uh, which is not really something you hear anymore. It's kind of an archaic term. Maybe you would have heard it in the, in the 40s and 50s. That also re referred to, uh, you know, homosexuality. So, uh, you know, it, it's really true. The things you hear about the Greeks, the Greeks were, 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 were accepting of homosexuality, uh, more so for men. Uh, but also, you know, you have your examples like Sappho of Lesbos, who wrote about uh, women and love and erotic poetry that uh, 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 mostly, I guess, would be most of the poets at the time would have been men. Right. So. So that's interesting. But the big one is, of course, Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, does anybody know about Mary Wollstonecraft? Yes. Excellent. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Mary Wollstonecraft? Um, I believe she lived in 19th century England. Was it 19th century England? 18th or 19th. I'm yeah, actually, I'll, I'm going to double check right now, actually. Yeah, I think so. Um, her partner was um, the guy who wrote about, um, what's his name again? She wrote with her partner. Um, she wrote a vindication of the rights of women. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, and it was, yeah, 1759. She lived 1759 mm -hmm. to 1797. So not, not, not a long life. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, she wrote a vindication of the rights of women, where, which, and she was influenced by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, basically, uh, you know, Rousseau is, is a guy who's writing, um, you know, he's a, he's a liberal thinker. He's like, look, we can have uh, freedom. We can all do what we want. We can go back to this sort of, um, you know, this sort of paradise if we want. You know, when we were talking about, uh, Marshall McLuhan and um, and even Marx previously, this idea that um, uh, we started in some kind of you know egalitarian paradise and society, current society is what screws everything up for us, uh, makes us not have the rights that we ought to have. You know, these are natural rights, rights that we have by virtue of just the way we are, or because God gave them to us, or something like that. 
So Rousseau is like this. He's like, you know, he, he's the guy who used to use the term, and this is not the preferred nomenclature, uh, but the noble savage. And he, he, he envisioned uh, past society, you know, we were, where we were all living according to our nature, all getting along perfectly well, all respecting each other's rights. It's kind of the opposite of Thomas Hobbes' state of nature, which is a brutal war of all against all. And life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, right? So uh, Wollstonecraft is uh, very much influenced by Rousseau. But she's like, hey, Rousseau, why y'all only got to be talking about men? Um, she's extending these rights. So it's like, hey, these rights are for all, all humans, not just men. What are you talking about, Rousseau? So, um, and she also later wrote a book about the vindication of the rights of man, which is very interesting. And so Mary Wollstonecraft is sort of like one of the originators of, of I guess what we could call proto-feminism or feminist, you know, the, the origins of feminist philosophy. Yeah, her paper, Max says here, this is an interesting point. Her paper got compared to animal rights, right? Like as if, arguing for rights for women would be equivalent to giving rights to animals, right? And uh, she was attacked a lot for her views. Um, her, I think her husband tried to publish a defense of her work, um, which ended up, he inadvertently like actually made it worse by publishing this defense. Um, and her work kind of disappeared into obscurity for a little while. It wasn't until much later that it was sort of rediscovered. And now you can find it in philosophy textbooks. I'm looking over there at my, um, my modern philosophy book that I have all the way back. Uh, and, and Vindication of the Rights of Women is in there. But not many other uh, 17th, 18th, or 19th century women philosophers, unfortunately. Max says, I think she makes the good point to say if women are biologically wired to be girly and motherly, why is there a need for socialization and education of girls to be that way? So it's an, uh, an appeal to nature, right? Women can, women can learn other things, right? Max, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's more so <clears throat> she was making a point critiquing like the current socialization of girls at our time where it was like, oh, we're educating women in this way because it's natural for them to do so. Yeah. If that would be the case, then it's like, why, why is there need to facilitate this? Yeah. And then, and then she then makes the point that it's not actually natural. The construction of what, you know, a woman is, is social and based off of these, you know, power structures. Yeah. And she also makes a lot of good points against private property in that one. Yeah. yeah, and I think in that sense, she's probably following Rousseau again, um, right? Uh, but she, uh, unfortunately, you know, her work, like I said, kind of disappeared for a little bit. Now we talk about her a lot, which is good. We're talking about her right now. Um, uh, but, you know, um, an interesting thing, another interesting thing about uh, Mary Wollstonecraft is uh, her daughter. Does anybody know? Anyone anyone know who her daughter is? It's actually really cool. Also named Mary. No guesses? What's that noise? Sorry, I'm hearing noises. Um, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft's daughter was one Mary Shelley, who would go on to write the novel Frankenstein which is considered to be one of the first science fiction books. Uh, and um, I mean, if books count as technology, well, hey, that's pretty cool. Uh, she may have invented science fiction. So that's really neat. So that's kind of like proto-feminism, right? Then you get to the 20, uh, the, well, first the 19th century, where as, uh, who was it that mentioned before? Ah, yeah, Stefan mentioned um, the suffragettes, the suffragettes. Who were the suffragettes? Well, they wanted votes for women, right? Women were not allowed to participate politically. They were not allowed to own property. And this kind of maybe goes to 
why Wollstonecraft, as Max mentioned, was arguing that we should abolish private property. Why the heck can men have property and women cannot, right? I mean, really. So, um, <clears throat> so the suffragettes would be uh, an example of, um, of uh, early feminism, right? Fighting for the vote, the right to participate in, in politics and public life. Um, uh, very, very important. Very, very important. Um, and kind of kicked off the first wave of feminism, I think. Um, I'm actually not, I'm not super clear on where the first and second waves begin. So if somebody wants to jump in and correct me, then go ahead. But, but women's suffrage was a big part of, uh, I believe, the first wave, as was, um, you know, liberation from, uh, from the home. Uh, a, a big part of this was was due to the the first and second world wars too, especially the second world war. Um, you know, you guys know Rosie the Riveter, right? Nobody's seen Rosie the Riveter. Of course, you have. No. Oh, yes, Evan. I'm gonna Google it. Let me just show you Rosie the Riveter real quick. She's very famous. If you have not seen her, uh, then, well, you, you, you have, but, oh no, my computer's too slow. <laughs> oh, curse my slow computer. I'll have to use my phone. Oh, there it goes. Okay, Rosie the Riveter, real quick. You'll know her when you see her. Um, So it's like a cultural icon. Uh, there's a very famous image of her that was on posters, which for some reason I, I'm not finding here. Oh, there it is. Rosie the Riveter. We've all seen Rosie the Riveter. Not just on a poster, but, you know, there were real life Rosies, uh, they were called. Women who went to work in the factories. Yeah, we, we can do it. Yeah, strong muscles, because she's riveting. She's building the war machine, right? Uh, all the Rosies were all the women who went to work in factories while men were off fighting in the war, right? So, and that was important because that's where you started to get women liberated from household work. So suffrage and and the sort of changing uh sort of changing role of women socially uh, is a big part of first wave feminism. Second wave feminism is really about, um, you have like your liberal feminism, which is, you know, uh, equal pay uh, for women, access to contraception, stuff like that. And you also have radical feminism, um, which kind of, uh, it's not what Fox News pundits make it sound like. Uh, or bigots on the internet make it sound like it's not. What radical feminis feminism wants to do is sort of reorganize the power structures in society. So identify, you know, um, the power structures that uh, keep men in power, like get rid of the patriarchy is, is what radical feminism is all about. And as I mentioned before, we also have feminist epistemology. So the questioning of uh, uh, positivism, right? talking about um, uh, Kuhn. Kuhn. Kuhn becomes a big uh, topic of discussion here. Tula, come here. Come here, baby. Sorry, my dog's being silly. Come here. Come lie down. Come lie down. Come here. There you go. Oh, pupper. So yeah, um, the questioning of positivism. Um, Thomas Kuhn's philosophy, his historical approach, right? This all became discussed to a great extent. I'll read some more from page 137 here. The, the, these slides are quote heavy, but, but that's okay. A number of philosophical tendencies in the latter part of the 20th century were exploited, developed, and extended by feminist epistemologists, theorists of knowledge, and philosophers of science and technology. Criticism of logical positivism 
and the psychology, psychologically and socially oriented post-positive philosophies, such as those of Thomas Kuhn, as well as Stephen Tolman, Paul Feyerabend, and Michael Polanyi, or Paula Polanyi, I always mispronounce that name, <laughs> opened issues and topics concerning social and psychological biases in science for feminist philosophers. Likewise, phenomenological and hermeneutic approaches from a continental philosophy that eventually were assimilated in U.S. philosophy gave an entree to feminists to produce or to introduce the role of context, personal feelings, and social situation into the philosophy of science. So that's very interesting to me. Um, just, just to take the work of Thomas Kuhn as an example, Kuhn, I imagine, would have been quite helpful, or Kuhn's work would have been quite helpful in crit critiquing positivism. Remember, positivism is all about verifying facts. Um, uh, is a statement about the world true? Yes, good. No, bad. If we can't tell if it's true or bad, then that's just as bad as if it's not true, right? Positivism. Uh, and that's all there is to science. Of course, now we, we got into verificationism, uh, from, uh, from verificationism to falsificationism by way of Popper as we learned earlier, uh, but also Thomas Kuhn comes along and says, hang on, like, you know, science also goes through these paradigms and they kind of change periodically when the current paradigm stops working and the sort of old guard dies off, right? Uh, who else, who else? Um, oh, Quine, obviously Quine is important here. If you recall the, the, the Duhem-Quine thesis, you know, that, well, we don't really falsify theories, we just falsify parts of them and then modify them. So we're never really falsifying entire theories. And the interesting thing about Quine is, um, he thinks of minds, I get the, I, I get the sense that he thinks of minds as, as little, little scientists too, that our own minds, and our belief system is like our scientific theory. And we're always, testing our theory our hypothesis when we're out there observing the world and interacting with the world and we're always sort of tweaking it updating our beliefs or at least we should be right not everyone does this but yeah this is really interesting because Kuhn gives you the some of the tools you need to fight positivism but he is also writing from a male perspective um quite a privileged one I mean dude dude was teaching at Harvard I mean that's a university for wealthy folks, if there ever was one. And uh, yeah, um, some of the examples that he has to look at are going to be predominantly male. Um, a lot of the examples rather because uh, of like of, of, of scientific practice, because there were barely any women doing science because of the patriarchy, right? So, uh, you know, all I'm saying is that feminist philosophers had a lot of material to work with around this time. And uh, they were influenced from both sides of the tradition, from the sort of Anglo-American side and, and, from the, and from the continental side. Ah, where's my mouse? Oh, I can't find my mouse. Oh, there it is. It just disappears sometimes. So strange. Now, Duzik uh, mentions here three areas of concern uh, which have occupied feminist philosophers of technology. Uh, one is um, that women's contributions to technology and invention are generally overlooked. Uh, another is that the effect of technology on women, uh, including household technology and reproductive technology, that's especially uh, been an area of concern for feminist philosophers of technology. And also, uh, we won't get to this part today, but we will start getting to, to these effects of technology, but also gendered descriptions of nature, nature metaphors, uh, uh, gendered metaphors of technology and nature and that kind of thing. So well, what I wanna do is just kind of follow these areas of interest um, and, and get some discussion going. We'll probably just talk about the first two today. Um, the second one is quite long. But I will mention it's got a lot to do with Bacon, you know, the Baconian inductivism, uh, just a little bit of foreshadowing. Bacon, um, and I know I've talked about this before, but Bacon uses a lot of um, 
when he's talking about uh, when Francis Bacon is talking about his inductivism, uh, he he talks a lot about uh, nature as if nature is a woman, you know. Which okay, we that we have that. That's been a part of Indo-European language for like five thousand years. The idea of a sky father and earth mother is like as old as the Proto-Indo-European language, which is pretty old. That's the language that all Indo-European languages are, are derived from. Yeah, Mother Nature. Mother Nature, the Earth Mother, and then you have the Sky Father. The Sky Father, incidentally, in Proto-Indo-European would be um, uh, Dus Patar, Sky Father, which is cognate with Jupiter and Zeus uh, and, and all those, you know, Sky Father gods that control the lightning, right? Whereas Earth, you know, is like Gaia, right? In Greek, you have Gaia. She's the Earth goddess. So, and uh, Bacon comes along and says, well, you know, you really have to seduce nature, right? Um, you need to torture her to get her secrets. Uh, you need to penetrate the dark places. He uses this language of seduction and rape. And when you read it, it's like, like, ugh, like, I don't know, I, I get like kind of grossed out when I was reading some of the quotes. I was like, ugh, like it, it makes me feel kind of dirty reading Bacon because he's just kind of like uh, the way he writes about nature is as if he's some kind of creep uh, trying to get nature to get into his van or something like it's it's really weird. But that was the attitude toward women at the time. And Bacon was, um, you know, Bacon was. Um, yeah, Bacon was a guy who had power. He was a he was a man, a man of his day. So, uh, okay, let's go on. Let's talk about uh, the first thing here, which is ooh, overlooked contributions to technology. Oh my goodness! I think for my birthday, I'm going to buy myself a new computer. I'm going to save up and buy a new one. It's going to be great. So speaking of technology and computers and women's contributions to them, women have played a huge role in technology. Absolutely huge. You would not think this. You would absolutely not think this, given the way that we're taught about uh, science and technology. You know, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, since probably the 60s or 70s, was thought of as like a man's field. Um, you know, boys go and be scientists, girls stay home and become housewives or something, right? Uh, which is weird, because this is the 50s and 60s. This is after the war, when women had, you know, women had the right to vote in, in, in most Western countries. And they had perhaps, some of them, been working outside of the home. Um, so not only did they have a job at the factory while their husband's off uh, fighting a war, they've also got to come home and maybe take care of the kids, you know, so that's like two jobs. Um, but then you have the 50s, uh, the, the late, late 40s, 50s and 60s, where women are still making contributions to technology, but that these but 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 that are getting overlooked. Earlier than this, I, I, and I've mentioned this before, and uh, Duzik does not mention this, but my favorite example is Lady Ada Lovelace, 1815 to 1852. Like Wollstonecraft, uh, not a very long life, but she's arguably the first computer programmer. You see, Charles Babbage, oh, where am I? There I am. Charles Babbage was um, the Lucasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge. It's the same seat that Isaac Newton held back in the day. Who was, um, who was also weird about women, by the way. We'll get to that in a moment. But, uh, and that would later be held by Stephen Hawking. So that's the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics Chair. And Charles Babbage uh, invented a, um, a computer, uh, well, several computers. He first invented the difference engine, which he never completed building. And then the analytical engine, which also was never completed. The designs were there, parts of it were built and it would have worked, um, but he never finished building it. What this computer was, 
uh, was essentially a modern digital computer, uh, modern digital computer, like in terms of its logic. Um, it, it used punch cards and gears and wheels and you, you would, could be forgiven if you thought it was an analog computer. If you looked at it and saw all those mechanisms, you'd think, oh, that's analog. But no, no, it wasn't. It was digital because it was a discrete state machine. It could only be in one state at a time. Remember, analog representation is continuous. Digital representation is discrete. Um, so had Babbage finished the thing and got it working, uh, it would have been the first Turing complete computer. Alan Turing didn't come along and 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 come up with his uh, Turing machines and whatnot until the 30s, the 1930s. This was a hundred years before that. But what Turing completeness is is um, it means you have a universal Turing machine. It means that your um, general purpose computer can run any specialized Turing machine. Uh, this is a universal Turing machine. So is the computer I'm working on right now. Uh, most co computer programming languages are now Turing complete. We can use them to build, to program any specialized Turing machine that we want. Anything that can compute what is computable, we can do it. And the, the analytical engine would have been one of those if it were working. Now, add a Lovelace corresponded uh, with um, Babbage. She was a real smart woman. And she wrote a program for this computer uh, that would have been used to calculate, uh, I think like, uh, I forget what it was for. It was for calculating certain numbers, Booleans or, or, or something. So for this reason, she's, she's uh, thought to be, or widely considered to be the first computer programmer. And later on, Alan Turing would, would, would discuss some of her work in his papers. Um, especially those dealing with uh, artificial intelligence and the Turing test. Um, when it comes to objections against machines being determined and humans not being determined, he calls that Lady Lovelace's objection because Lady Lovelace wrote to Babbage and says, you know, the analytical engine can only do what we tell it to do. Um, it can't originate anything like a human can. So... It's funny because I was reading this last night and there's actually some uh, stories about these two. Um, let's see. I'm trying to find. Uh, I can't find it, but there's a comic book. I kind of want to read it now uh, based on an alternate history where um, Babbage built his analytical engine. Yeah, so that would be why, yeah. CPU architecture is named after Lovelace to acknowledge her contribution as the first programmer. And that's great to see. I really like to see that. Um, so uh, Maybe one of you can find this. I saw it last night and now I can't remember the title or the author, but there's a comic book where, where it's an alternate history and, uh, and they build the analytical engine. So Vic Victorian era Britain has computer computing technology. And um, Charles Babbage and Lady Lovelace use computers to solve crime uh, at the request of Queen Victoria. And uh, that sounds awesome. <laughs> so I really want to read that. Um, I, I can't remember the title. I'm going to have to go and find it. But I mean, wow, what an imaginative, uh, what an imaginative story. Another thing that's really cool is the COBOL computer language. It's a business computer language. It's meant to be very intuitive, right? Um. It's based on another coding language that was used on an old computer at Harvard during the Second World War that was developed by Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper was another early computer scientist and computer programmer. She worked with this Harvard uh, computer um, decrypting messages during the Second World War, and she eventually rose to become a rear admiral in the United States Navy. So Grace Hopper is another one that, before prepping for this, never heard of her. What a tragedy, right? So Grace Hopper is really cool. You should go learn more about Grace Hopper. 
or in anthropology, there's some interesting examples. You know, we have this man, the hunter theory, right? That was the unifying theory of anthropology in the 60s. You probably know the basic idea that women were out gathering and men were hunting, but the role of, of man as the hunter was emphasized uh, more than gathering. It was, it, was, it was emphasized because it was thought that it was more important to go on these big game hunts. And this was, of course, something that men did. So men were bigger and stronger, but also uh, the argument goes that men are what pushed our species to become more intelligent because we, we needed to develop technology like spears and spear throwers to, uh, to get these big game. Uh, we had to coordinate socially, so we probably needed language. So the, the idea is that man the hunter pushed humans further in terms of evolution, but it ignored the contributions of gatherers. And the gatherers were probably women, uh, women or, or young people. Uh, children probably would have been helping out a bit too. But on the alternative women, the gatherer theory, uh, which is a feminist theory, it's, it's argued that gathering not just gathering, but storing and preserving food actually provided more nutrition than big game hunts. The big game hunts actually took place rarely. You could see this in, um, you can still see this in cultures today, uh, hunter-gatherer cultures today. Big game hunts are not common. What's more common is everybody getting together and gathering or going fishing. That's a big one. Big game hunts are quite rare. And women do actually participate in them. Like we've got fossil evidence of like old, old humans, uh, women who have injuries that could have only been sustained from, you know, wrestling with some kind of large animal. So we know that there were women joining the hunt. And we also know that probably um, gathering played a bigger role in terms of nutrition and not just gathering but preserving the food because you can't just have your food you need to make sure that it won't spoil so you've got to dry things you've got to cure things uh, these are all forms of technology and if the woman the gatherer theory is true and women were predominantly gatherers well then women are responsible for a very important sort of technology Right, especially in northern climates where you know you need to preserve food for the winter because uh, a lot of animals are hibernating and plants aren't growing. Yeah, that's why salt was a luxury. That's right, Stefan, because we figured out very early on that we could preserve food by salting it, getting the water out. Uh, similarly, we would smoke food. And eventually we came up with all kinds of ways to preserve food. Sausages are my favorite. You know, that's that's sausages kind of grew from taking the leftovers that you didn't want to waste and stuffing it into the into the guts and cooking it. Yeah, mm, I'm getting hungry. But anyway, um, yeah, women that gather also they're like, I, I, yeah, if you look at I, I know I just said this earlier, but if you look at modern day hunter gatherer societies, firstly, not all of them even need to go big game hunting. A lot of um, societies that still live um, still live very close to nature in whether we're talking about South America, Africa, North America, or um, South Asia, a lot of the nutrition comes from fishing, right? We know what they say about fish. It's brain food. Well, it really is. There's lots of protein. It's good for you. Um, it's a, and, and it's less dangerous. Most kinds of fishing are less dangerous than, you know, trying to go out and hunt a woolly mammoth or something, right? So, uh, you know, and, and when, we, when we see these communities going and doing this, uh, going and doing like a big fish or, or going into the forest and gathering lots of fruit, it's men and women and, and older children are coming along too. So uh, I think that it's a lot more, that ancient, uh, ancient humans were, probably a lot more egalitarian. I think that the patriarchy really got going once the agricultural revolution happened, because then all of a sudden you have property and, you know, you have offspring and you want your offspring to inherit your property. Um, 
so monogamy becomes more important property rights marriage these are all things that probably were not really that they weren't really like institutionalized before agriculture so yeah i'm just saying can we think of any more examples of overlooked um uh, contributions to technology from women Here's one in the chat. Really? What a bastard. And there was, there's a bit in the book. So, oh, ha, huh, of course. Wow. Oh, yes, yes. Um, yeah. Well, there was a movie about this woman. Oh, and a, a woman invented Kevlar. Wow. Oh, that's that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. But I do know about the, uh, there was a movie. There was a movie about this, about the three women. Uh, they were black women working for NASA in the 60s during segregation. And one of them made these, she was a math prodigy, right? What's her name? I can't remember. What was that movie called? Hidden figures, my girlfriend, she remembered. Hidden figures, that's right. Uh, and there was a, that's about the women who made important contributions to the effort to go to the moon. Uh, and the, the woman that I'm thinking of and that was mentioned in the comments, she was a math whiz. There was another one who was a computer programmer. It's really good. You should watch the movie, go read about it. It's really good. Uh, what else? Um, what else? There's an example in the textbook of a woman inventor who applied for a patent on technology for like a river dam. Um, but the patent officer mistook it for a sink dam that you'd put in your sink just because she was a woman. <laughs> like, I mean, this seems weird to us now. I mean, we have come a long way. There are still issues we need to address. Absolutely. But we have come a long way, and and it's just it's just mind boggling. Tula, come here. Come here. Uh, it's just mind boggling, and that's what I well, that's kind of what I want to do with those um, examples of sexist commercials that I want you to watch. You know, you watch them, and you'll you'll be like surprised, but not surprised. You'll be like, like I was. I said, wow, I knew that commercials were sexist in the 50s but i had no experience of how sexist they were and i that's why i said i was just kind of like aghast like 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 shock laughing at them you know what i mean it's yeah so if i think of any more uh i'll i'll bring them up oh one thing i was going to say one of the reasons why a lot of reasons why we still don't have a lot of women compared to men in stem um, is because of the way that uh, toys were marketed, you know, early home computers, um, you know, women, you, computer used to be a human job title, right? If you, it, it, in Alan Turing's day, computers were people um, and they would do calculations on paper, you know, um, then we invented digital computers. And uh, so women used to be computers, uh, in a in a sense, they, men and women both used to be computers, uh, in 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 the human computer sense. But then we invented digital computers, and then sometime later we started uh, having home computers, and these were marketed toward men and and boys, even though women before that were were working with computers a lot. And this actually affected that next generation that grew up. We had a whole generation of women who grew up in the sixties and seventies who we're just never told about this stuff. Like, hey, here's a computer. You can program it. You can go do stuff with this. You could grow up and invent better computers or write programs. There's a whole generation of women that never got that just because of the way these little early home computers were marketed. 
Um, so yeah, that sucks. That really sucks. But luckily that is changing. Uh, another kind of technology, um, oh, so so a particular kind of technology that that uh, has particular effects on women is, of course, household technology, uh, and that's because you know, as I said, even even after uh, women's suffrage happened and after women kind of um, you know went into the workplace, and not just into the workplace. I mean, women were working for a bit before this, but their job prospects were rather limited. Uh, leading up to the Second World War, well, I remember my grandmother. This was before I went to college and uh, she was asking me what I wanted to do. And I'm, you know, I don't really know. And she's telling me about when she was young, how women had two choices, secretary or nurse. There was a, a women's college and they had those two programs and that was it, secretary or nurse. So there were secretaries, nurses, uh, women were working, but then women started working in factories and, and working in places that predominantly men had worked in before the war. Then the war ended and women are back in the household, still kind of expected to do all this housework, right? And household technology is changing a lot in the early and mid 20th century. Um, uh, things like vacuum cleaners, washing machines, microwaves, the invention of frozen food. And of course the automobile, not really a household appliance, but still an important piece of technology. All of this changed work, uh, a lot of which women were doing and not always for the better, right? We tend to think that home appliances like these actually make our lives easier, but do they really? Well, washing machines, for example, make work easier. You know, imagine you can just throw a load in to the washing machine now, it's great. Well, not me, I have to walk to a laundromat, but it's a small price to pay. So I walk to the laundromat and I throw it in a machine and I just sit there and it cleans it. Amazing, the wonders of technology. Back before then, you'd have to wash by hand, like scrub with a washboard. And then you'd have to wring it out with one of those wheel ringy, ringy things. Yeah, Stefan, going to what I said earlier, you're absolutely right. Computer science was the fastest growing STEM discipline amongst women in the 70s until, until the 80s. Uh, until, you know, when you started to get those home computers um, just marketed for boys. Um, yeah, the consequences have have totally um, have total are totally still being felt. AC says, uh, I'm taking a course in cryptography, and my prof mentioned that there was a Chinese film professor that broke Sha Zero, a hashtag alg a hashing algorithm that was used universally back in uh, 2004. Oh, there you go. See, see, women are women make very important contributions to STEM. This whole idea that women are not good at math or science or that or that math and science are traditionally male things, it's, it's nonsense. It's absolutely nonsense. And, and, and we're going to get into some of the physiology, I think, later on in the chapter. But there have been, uh, there are some anatomical differences, very slight ones between male and female brains. But that's not a good reason to think that men are any better at, you know, logic or math or stuff, and that women are, as it goes, often, you know, more emotional. Like, there's all kinds of ways this was spun. Like, oh, men are left-brained and women are right-brained, or men have bigger brains, right? Like, it's nonsense. And trust me, this is something I do know about. I am a cognitive scientist. First and foremost, I'll tell you all about the brain and the mind till the cows come home. Or yeah, the old hysterical argument, right? W women are emotional. Uh, and if they're too emotional, maybe they're just hysterical. They have hysteria, which is not a real thing. Uh, it was a Victorian era mental health diagnosis. I mean, there certainly were women that had mental health problems, but um but maybe, maybe a lot of them had like legit actual depression or bipolar disorder or, you know, something diagnosable today, as opposed to just hysteria, which is, you know, just sort of a catch all for this, for crazy women. And the way it was treated was really messed up too. Do you guys know how hysteria was treated in Victorian England? 
I'm going to see if anyone can tell me because I don't know how comfortable I am talking about it. Lobotomy is not a bad guess. Maybe some were. Maybe some were lobotomized. Well, they took the uterus out. Um, in some cases, perhaps. <laughs> I think Tess knows where I'm going with this. Um, so hysteria is the reason why the vibrator was invented. And I'll let you guys connect the dots there. Yes. The treatment of hysterical women by predominantly male physicians was to endorse orgasms and induce orgasms and they got i guess they got tired of doing this you know that way so they invented the vibrator um which you know before i learned this i i, I honestly thought that, that 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 a woman had invented that i mean obviously of course it must have been a woman but no it was actually men uh crazy moments in the history of science and technology am i right so that goes to show you that the level of sexism and misogyny of the day, right? Like, like, yeah, we've come a long way. We still have work to do, but look how far we've come. Um, so, uh, yeah, washing machines. <laughs> Let's get back to washing machines. You have a washing machine. You might think to yourself, um, ah, yes. Okay, there you go. Yeah. And that's why we say, you know, removal of the uterus and the and the ovaries is a hysterectomy, right? Etymology, right? You're right about that. So yeah, um, washing machines, maybe you think they make your life easier, right? Well, yeah, washing one load in a washing machine is is much more efficient than doing it by hand. But uh, that meant that people simply started washing their clothes more often. So women still did lots and lots of work on the laundry. They did more laundry more efficiently, but the amount of work spent really didn't change because people were washing their clothes more often. Uh, same with the vacuum cleaner. If you've got a vacuum cleaner, well, great. I don't have to dust. Um, I don't have to sweep. I got my vacuum cleaner, nice and easy. Well, sure. But again, the average size of, of, of the home was increasing around the same time that vacuum cleaning technology was proliferating as well. So um, a lot of the technologies that were introduced that were advertised to make life easier actually kept us just as busy, men and women. Um, same way, uh, you know, same thing with uh, the automobile, you know, with the automobile, uh, that changed the way we purchased food. You think you have the automobile, you have freedom. You know, early automobiles were a luxury. I've got a quick digression on this that's actually really, really crazy. So you guys know the tire company, Michelin? Yeah, you know, the Michelin man, right? Give me a yes in the chat if you know the Michelin Man. Yeah, everyone's seen the Michelin Man. And who's heard of the, so, so the Michelin makes tires. Everybody's got a car. Probably go outside, you'll find some cars with Michelin tires, right? They're everywhere. But have you heard of the, of the Michelin Guide? It's the fancy restaurant guide, right? You, get, you go to a restaurant that has a Michelin star. It's a super fancy restaurant. You guys have heard of that, yeah? Yeah. Now, surprisingly, it's the same company. I just learned this recently. The, the company that makes tires is the same company that publishes the Michelin Restaurant Guide. Yeah, Julien, essentially, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I always thought, like, what? Why would, why would a company that makes tires be doing that? Well, the answer is really interesting. 
it's because the automobile uh when when michelin were, were were making their tires was the age when the automobile was still a luxury and that was also the time when the modern restaurant was emerging and michelin um yeah 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 the michelin the michelin guys who come in they don't even tell you that they're you don't know you don't know they're there they're dining in secret yeah so so michelin's making these tires uh, for the automobile, which is a gentleman's piece of technology. You know, I've got to take a horse and carriage or I've got to ride the omnibus. But Mr. Moneybags over here, he has an automobile and he's got a car with Michelin tires. What's he going to do? We need somewhere to go. So Michelin published a guide of fine restaurants uh, so that you had somewhere to take your car right and eat some fancy food and today because the automobile is so much more egalitarian it sounds weird like what the michelin guide is made by the tire company that sounds crazy because you know michelin star restaurants are incredibly posh incredibly fancy super expensive like haute cuisine um and cars are everywhere but no the reason is because cars used to be an elite thing just like going to a fancy fresh rest, uh, French restaurant. So that's a cool thing I learned earlier uh, that I, well, I just thought I'd share with all of you. But the automobile obviously changed things like purchasing food. Now you take your car to the grocery store. You know, before uh, egg, milk, uh, cheese, you know, lots of different things would be delivered to you. You know, the milkman. Everyone knows about the milkman. He's got his milk truck and he brings the milk right? I think back in my mom's day in the UK, my mom was born in England. They still had doctors making house calls. But I think that the milkman was was done by then. I'm not sure. I'm actually not sure. This would have been in the 60s. Um, I'm not sure how it was here in Canada at the time. But anyway, um, doctors by way of by way of introducing you know this doctors used to make house calls right uh but you know with the invention of the automobile now you go to the doctor doctor used to have to go around and make his rounds and check on everybody right uh, but now you go to the doctor you get in your car and you go right and, and it also changed things like you know we had extra time you know uh but we ended up using that time with for more things so that we're just as busy taking your kids to different activities right maybe you have a car so now you can get places faster what are you going to do you're going to go to more places you're going to take the kids to baseball right take little johnny to dancing or well no yeah screw it take little johnny to dance class and take little betty to the baseball game you know yeah that's what you're going to do you've got more stuff to do um so you're not less busy with this household technology. And a lot of the burden fell on women, right? Uh, and by the way, I mean, depending on what research you consult, being a stay-at-home uh, mom or a housewife is like the equivalent of two full-time jobs. It's a lot of work. Um, frozen food just incidentally since we were talking about food a while ago frozen food changed things because um you know now women didn't have to prepare as elaborate of a meal uh it, it took less time and less effort to make a meal which of course resulted in husbands not appreciating the skill it takes to cook which you know I'm thinking of midwife, midwife, midwife. Some modern practices know, known for the trauma they cause, but they are safer in terms of bringing living babies. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that uh, when we talk about reproductive technology. Midwifery used to be the norm, um, but then pregnancy sort of became medicalized. Uh, and, and, and of course, most midwives were women and most physicians are men. So this is not off topic, Vicente. Yeah, and we will talk about it. Uh, how are we doing for time? Oh boy, we're really going here. Um, food. I, I like I like this example because I like to cook. You know, I'm a bit of a home a home cook. 
Uh, I love making a, a, a big elaborate meal. So I know the effort that goes into it, you know, um, uh, and, and it's just sad that any cook, whether you're a man or a woman or whoever you are, I mean, if you put effort into a meal, it always tastes better when you make it nice for yourself or for somebody you love. And, you know, it sucks that frozen food comes along or fancy kitchen appliances come along and, and makes it look like the technology is doing all the work when really you've got a really excellent uh, person making some wonderful food. Doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, like food is, food is one of those things that makes life worth living. So anyway, I love food. Um, now in social, this is predominantly going on in Western countries. In socialist countries, um, there were efforts to sort of collectivize household work, you know, um, Laundry, for example, having big public laundries where men and women all worked together, um, cooking by men and women in big communal kitchens. This was tried, but it didn't really catch on. And the unfortunate thing is, like, the, the Soviet countries were strange. Like, they had fewer rights overall than Western countries, yet women were more equal in a lot of ways. You know, women in, in, in the USSR were able to, to work outside of the home if they wanted to, no problem. There was no stigma against it, but they were still expected to do all the housework after work. So, you know, not really a winning combination. So let's move on to talk about reproductive technology. Come on, where's, where's my mouse? So reproductive technology is obviously an area of concern for women. Um, and this kind of technology includes birth control, uh, access to abortion, uh, in vitro fertilization and other, other, sorts of, uh, other sorts of technology to assist re re reproduction. So we're talking about controlling or assisting reproduction here, right? Giving women more autonomy over their own bodies, right? Uh, kind of liberating the body from nature using technology. This is why it's going to be really cool when we finally talk about Donna Haraway and cyborg feminism. I think we'll talk about that next time. But yeah, Duzik writes, uh, during the first years of second wave feminism in the early 1970s, uh, Shula Smith Firestone's The Dialectic of Sex proposed that only separating women from pregnancy and childbirth through artificial wounds would achieve full equality of women. This technological fix approach was soon rejected by most feminists who tended to emphasize women becoming more involved in and in control of their pregnancies. Later feminists who emphasized the less desirable aspects of artificial reproduction technology as a means of power of male physicians over women also rejected it, right? So this is a little bit radical. Like if we could just make birth, uh, like gestation and birth take place completely outside of the body, with some kind of sci-fi artificial wombs, that would be the thing that ultimately liberates women. But a lot of people were like, well, no, I mean, I mean, uh, look, some, some women wanna have kids. Um, so they wanna have control over that, when to have them, how many to have, whom to have them with, right? Um, you know, that's a thing too, uh, that, that, uh, that some less radical thinkers sort of, so, uh, hey, hang on, hang on, let's not go too far here. Also, technologically speaking, we're like so far away from being able to do that anyway. Um, but who knows what the future will bring. Um, boop, 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 boop. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about reproductive technologies like birth control and abortion. So uh, these allow women more autonomy over their bodies and over, the, over their, their reproductive abilities, right? If you have birth control, like we have the pill or the shot um, and also access to abortion, they're important um, because before, before then you're, you know, you're at the mercy of nature. Yeah, sure, I know some couples try and have kids and then have them, um, but what about pregnancies that are unintended? I mean, before this, before reproductive technology, um, you just kind of had to go with it. And when you think about the fact that before modern medicine, 
I think one in four or one, one in five women are killed in childbirth without modern medicine because babies' heads are just so darn big, you know? Um, so it's risky. It's risky. Humans have evolved such large craniums that uh, giving birth is dangerous. Uh, it's not like this with other mammals. Go look at other mammals giving birth. It's like no problem. They just stand there and, and the baby comes out. Not with humans because we have our massive craniums with our big brains. So imagine that before reproductive technology uh, with unintended pregnancy, uh, you know, women were really rolling the dice. And even after this kind of technology, you know, people could get, uh, get abortions, uh, but uh, they were illegal. You know, uh, they were dangerous. They were not regulated. It's, it's even, I mean, hell, we're going back to this in the United States, for goodness sake. Uh, seeing, seeing the fight against um, access to abortion in the United States is really unnerving. Um, like we're, 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 it's like we're going back in time. It's nuts. Um, so, you know, uh, control over whether women want to become pregnant or whether, whether they want to have a baby. Um, so increasing women's control over their bodies, their bodily autonomy. And critics, though, point out that, you know, it's not all good. There are health concerns uh, with certain kinds of birth control. Uh, maybe these are downplayed or poorly researched. There's also no equivalent for men, which I know what you're thinking. I'm not like, uh, let me clarify what I'm saying there. Um, oh, Tess, really? What? Oh, wow. An AI robot. Oh, wow. I, okay, I'm going to go read that right after class. That sounds really interesting. Okay, so, all right. Maybe we're closer than we think. Boy, that's, oh, man. Oh, that's kind of like, whoa. Makes me think of the Matrix when everyone's in, like, a vat, you know? Um, but, wow. <laughs> awesome. So, yes, women get more autonomy because of, uh, you know, oh yeah, well, yeah, you're right. A lot of this AI, this, this like bleeding edge post-human future stuff is very ethically questionable. Um, so, so yeah, uh, but, but to get, to get back to uh, the birth control and the abortion, you know, um, there are health concerns. There are risks with certain hormonal birth controls. There are like increased risks of certain kind of cancer. So yeah, women get uh, more bodily autonomy, but in some cases there's arguably also an expectation like for the women to have to take the birth control and not for men to be responsible for, for birth control, wearing condoms or getting vasectomies or whatnot, right? Um, and, and often these health concerns are downplayed or they're poorly researched. Um, and there's, like I said a moment ago, there's no equivalent pill for men. Why not? I think there should be. Women have to take, if they're taking the pill, they have to take, you know, it's, it's a pain. It's a pain in the ass to have to take medication every day. I, I have to take medication every day and it's, uh, annoying. Um, it's it. So, yeah, I mean, I get it at least to that extent. Oh, really? I'd sign me up. I'd do it. Uh, okay, so remember, if you can think of a technology that seems like the central factor of a dystopian sci-fi novel, it's probably actually being researched for some unholy reason. <laughs> that should be like a law. Zach's first law of dystopia, dystopian science. Yeah. Oh, really? So this was recent, this non-hormonal. I mean, I'll tell you what, like, I'll, I would sign me up because, because, uh, yeah, let, let me do it. Let me take some of that worry off of uh, my partner's shoulders, perhaps, you know, uh, I, I'm totally down for this. Uh, I, it's like, the reason I say it's, there's no birth control for men, it's, it's not like, it's like, look, women shouldn't have to shoulder a disproportionate amount of the birth control burden, right? <laughs> that's kind of how i feel right now max like 
I, I see the world. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I'm trying not to be, look, I look at it this way. I'm a teacher. I'm an educator. Um, I don't need to have kids because I can teach hundreds and hundreds of people throughout my lifetime and maybe make an impact. I don't need to raise some tiny humans and cause some irreparable damage and, you know, maybe, maybe cause some tr mental trauma and emotional damage. Right. I, I don't want to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm good with being a teacher. Um, and, and maybe like, I think my sister wants kids so I can be an uncle, you know, I, I'll get to be a cool uncle one day. Take, take the kids to the science center teach them about STEM and philosophy and then leave them with the parents. Bye. Uncle Josh has to go back to, you know, being an adult with free time, you know? So that's what I think. Uh, on the flip side, we do have in vitro fertilization. We have embryo implantation and we have things like genetic screening. And these are technologies, you know, that are not uh, about preventing pregnancy, but promoting pregnancy for women who may not have been able to do that. My ex, uh, my old high school sweetheart, we're still friends, still very good friends. And, um, uh, and she has used uh, this kind of technology, her and her partner, uh, because she's crazy about kids, loves them. She's got one. She's got one of, no, hell, she's got two. She's got two of her own now. And a bunch of, from her partner's previous marriage. And they use this technology. Um, because, you know, like some women really want to have kids. Some women don't want to have kids at all. It's fine. Um, and uh, I believe they used uh, IVF. But they're all, they're all, all related. In vitro fertilization, in vitro means in glass, you know, in a test tube. Uh, fertilization outside of the body, uh, growing the embry embryo a bit, and then implanting it in the womb. That's what embryo implantation is. And of course, genetic screening. Often when we do IVF, we have many, uh, we create many zygotes, you know, little, little bunches of cells that will grow into embryos. We create a lot of them. Uh, you, you always want to end up with a bunch. Uh, and you can, you can test them genetically, screen them for any kind of abnormalities so that you don't get a baby with some kind of genetic dis uh, like discombobulation uh, thing. Um, this may add pressure though, for women to, uh, to reproduce, even though we've got all the birth control and stuff, you know, um, maybe, maybe some women who can't have children also don't want to have children and that's fine. Um, but they may feel pressure like, oh, there's this technology. Now you could have a baby and like, no, maybe I don't want to have a baby, you know? or to screen out genetic abnormalities. I put CF Iceland. That means confer Iceland. Iceland here is not a publication. Uh, but in Iceland, uh, there are like no people with Down syndrome. Uh, and that's because just culturally, um, screening uh, for genetic abnormalities is, is, uh, is, is just widespread. It's part of the, it's part of the, part of the culture in Iceland. And women, uh, women go and they'll get screened. And if there's, um, if there, if the fetus is uh, indicating genetically that it will will develop into somebody with Down syndrome, um, they will often terminate the pregnancy. So there's no there's no people with Down syndrome in Iceland. It's crazy. Um, and I, I kind of wonder how far back culturally this goes. Iceland, after all, is um, is a harsh place to live. Think about it. It's called Iceland for a reason. Um, it was settled by um, by people from Scandinavia and the Northern United Kingdom, mostly men from Scandinavia and women from Scotland and Ireland. They were they were often enslaved uh, by the men. And they lived there, and it was a very tough place to eke out a living. And one of the things that was practiced was exposure. Exposure is, uh, you know, before this is, I apologize, this is quite, quite morbid, but exposure is a form of infanticide that before we had abortions, uh, we would simply expose babies, the women would have the baby. And if the baby was in some way, you know, defective, um, it would simply be left out in nature, 
often it would be given a symbolic weapon, like a knife or an axe, but it would be just left out in nature and would often die of exposure or be killed by some animal. Um, uh, so this was practiced in many, many areas, uh, but it was definitely practiced in Iceland. And even when Iceland became a Christian nation, um, one of their conditions was actually, we want to still be able to expose babies. They had a number of conditions like we'll be, we'll be Christian, but you can't, um, you can't stop us from, from having our folklore, you know, the sagas, uh, you can't stop us from exposing babies. So it's uh yeah, geez, life, man, human life, humans, like, look, look, just thank goodness you're alive right now and not, not some other place a thousand years ago. I'll just say that. I know we have a lot to do. I know we have a long way to go. Uh, but I say this to myself all the time. Thank goodness that I was not born in ancient Greece or medieval England or dark age Iceland. Um, yeah, thank goodness. And to even live in a place on earth where things aren't too crazy. I feel badly for, uh, you know, there's a, there's a civil war in, in, in like Ethiopia right now. There's fighting in Yemen. There's the Ukraine situation, Israel-Palestine conflict. I mean, God, you really have to stop and count your lucky stars sometimes when you think about humans, our history and, and current events. You, yeah, you know. So it's about time to stop. And we're not even finished. I thought I didn't think we were, I thought I wasn't going to have enough slides, but that's how it always goes. I, in my worry of under preparing, I over prepare. So perhaps we'll finish off this bit on um, what the radical feminists have to say next time. And then we're going to move on to other kinds of, uh, of technology, technology in the workplace, actually, is I think where we're going to go after this. So let's stop my screen share. And uh, yeah, 1256, according to my watch. So, oh yeah, I wanted to say a little something about an extension. Um, I still haven't decided when I'm going to extend the third reading response. I probably extended another week. So I'm just putting that out there uh, for all of you. Like uh, I'll probably make the change on Brightspace later today, but I'm probably going to give an extension because I have just been, um, I've just been falling behind on a lot of things. And, and I, yeah, I was, I was about to say, Stefan, I wanted, I'm just, I'm, I'm getting there. Liam has been fantastic. Liam is working ahead of me and he's also working on his thesis. So props to Liam. He is doing a fantastic job. Um, and I have just been so busy with prep and with some upcoming stuff in the summer that I, I'm sorry that it's taken me this long. I, I am going to get it done. Um, over the weekend at the latest and then I'll probably make the reading response due I, I think it's due on the 31st yeah that that's the great thing about Liam he really is making himself quite available for everybody yeah so I think this was normally going to be due on the 31st I think I might extend it to the 7th and that will give you lots of time to absorb the feedback that we give you yeah that's the thing I think a lot of this is just burnout and I I don't want this to seem unprofessional but it's just like I know that everybody is feeling this right now. I know that most of my students are feeling burnt out. I know that most of my colleagues are feeling burnt out. I am feeling burnt out. I am not a robot. I am a human. And um, yeah, uh, we all got to do our best and hang in there. You know, so that's why I'm so good. I, I, that's why I'd like, I'm pretty charitable when, when stuff comes up for students, you know, like, hey, professor, I got a thing. I can't hand my thing in on time. No problem. I'm always pretty good about that throughout the throughout the pandemic. So, um, oh my goodness, I'm blathering away here. It's time to go. Everybody have a good weekend. Um, enjoy yourselves. Hopefully we get some sunshine and I'll see you all on Tuesday and we'll continue talking about feminism and technology and it's going to be lots of fun. Okay, so thanks everybody. Bye for now. Hmm, cheers. Thanks everyone.